This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode number 800, recorded on September 2nd, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Well, there's no airplane that's 800, but that's a pretty good number for this episode, <laughs> Daniel. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I, I like 800. I'm, I'm happy with this. Uh, I only wish the clinical update had been 80. You know, we should have, like, timed it. So it's clinical update 78, but it's episode 800, so... I don't know. I think we're going to be doing this for some time, don't you, Daniel? Yeah. You know, I'm going to do like the Anthony Fauci thing where I just put my hand in my face and say, oh my gosh, it's two years into this. And yeah, you know, you started, I think, what, in the 500s, right? Yes. You live 500s. And um, yeah, I, I would not be surprised if we're not hitting a thousand, you know, and, and the pandemic is still something we're, we're talking about and still trying to get through. Um, I remember gotta, your, your <laughs> I'm sorry, just one more thing. I remember yeah. your first clinical reports were from your car in the hospital parking lot, remember? I, I remember that. And then I was like trying to do it in the stairwell, but I was worried that there was like a crack under the door and yes. the whole ICU had been turned into a theoretical negative pressure. And so, yep. yeah, it's quite a ways, but um, all right, let's jump in. We have a lot to do today. Um, and Vincent, you jump in at any point because I'm going to touch on a few um, controversial things. All right. Um, so I'm expecting a lot of, a lot of hate mail. Uh, you know, I'd like to get that. <laughs> oh, you must be saying ivermectin, right? <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about ivermectin. Um, <laughs> so let me return to Winston Churchill. I, I, I feel like I'm sort of back in the Winston Churchill um, sort of mood. Um, a fanatic is one who can't change his mind and won't change the subject. So we'll we'll figure out who the fanatic is if it's if it's me or if it's uh, you know people that uh, I try to talk to. Um, you know I like to keep saying a single point does not make a line. Um, we do keep learning. We do keep moving forward. Um, so I think people can take a deep breath. You're, you're still you're not going to wake up tomorrow and find out that you know everything we've thought to date is completely wrong. Um, but I'm going to talk about a number of items right up front: um, ivermectin and convalescent plasma. Um, so I ivermectin has been in the news a lot lately, and I've actually been getting a lot of calls, a lot of questions about it. Um, and you know, I, I I think early on I sort of said that this was going to happen. And, and what did I say was going to happen? We are two years into this pandemic, and we still do not have really clear data on the role of ivermectin in COVID nineteen. We certainly do not know what what a correct dose or timing might be if someone wants to use this. Um, and I am going to say this, you know, the the way the media sort of portrays this, I'm going to challenge. Um, you know, there are certain individuals that I know who are looking at studies out there, and they they are themselves convinced by the data. Um, I am not convinced by the data for ivermectin, nor is the FDA. But what I think we're all on the same page with is um, that you should not be using your horses, your dogs, animal preparations of ivermectin. I don't think there's any, um, you know, any physician that I know or respect who would be advocating that. And even the frontline COVID critical care alliance, which has been, um, I'll say, supportive of ivermectin, they actually came out with a statement on August 27th, very clearly stating, um, this is from them, we support the FDA's direction that humans should never take medication formulations meant for animals. We also agree that self-dosing of medications without the guidance of a physician is potentially dangerous and could cause serious harm. So, um, you know, please stop stealing your dogs, your horses, or your other animals deworming medication. Um, you know, it did, did occur to me, do we deworm cats? Apparently, um, indoor cats don't need to be dewormed, but, um, you know, you should deworm your dogs. Um, but um, we currently do not have the data to know if there is a role for ivermectin in the treatment of COVID-19. And this has created a vacuum. And I think that's what I talked about, you know, really about two years ago, is ivermectin is one of the most prescribed and used medications for people with COVID. Um, and until we really get clear data, that's going to continue. Just, you know, physicians have the ability to use medications off-label. People, as we're seeing, have the ability to get stuff that they feel that 
social media is supporting. Um, there are a number of large trials trying to address this question, right? Um, so in the US, I've talked about this, we have the ACTIV-6 trial. There's the COVID out trial being run by a um, friend of mine at University of Minnesota. In the UK, they have the principal trial. Um, there's a lot of trials. Um, you know, this is the way we move forward in medicine. Um, science, it, it's not nothing mysterious. It's really you in a non-biased way um, ask the question, do people do better with or without a certain therapeutic? So if people are excited about ivermectin, um, and actually did, I emailed Paul Merrick and Pierre Corey, who I know, know well, and he said, hey, maybe on the front of your website, you can actually add ways for patients to connect with clinical trials. That, that's really, um, you know, sort of where I'm going to go with that. Do you have a comment there, Vincent? So what do you tell people, Daniel, who write all the time, well, I took ivermectin and I got better? You know, this is goes back to the three most dangerous words, right? You know, in my experience, right? You can't you can't string anecdotes. Um, the pillar of anecdotes is not data. You know, most people, right, with COVID get better. Most people that didn't take ivermectin get better. Most people that took ivermectin get better. The question is, if you took ivermectin, did that increase your chance of getting better? Um, and there actually is, um, you know, a, a problem now. And I'm going to actually, I think I'm going to bring up the CDC page. There's a bunch of individuals who have had some really horrible experiences with ivermectin. Um, and I'm, there's actually a, a CDC um, brief that they sent out, sort of an alert, um, where they actually described cases. There was an adult who drank an injectable ivermectin formulation intended for use in cattle. Um, they presented the hospital with confusion, drowsiness, hallucinations, tachypnea, tremors. They ended up being hospitalized. Um, there was another individual who ended up with altered mental status after taking ivermectin tablets of unknown strength purchased on the internet. Um, so I, I think that we have to really be clear here. Um, this is not something, you know, if something works, it might have side effects. And so it's really a balance. Um, you know, drink your tap water and okay, there's no side effects there, but there's also no efficacy. So um, yeah, um, you know, and I often get patients who ask me, you know, Dr. Griffin, would you recommend ivermectin? And I think as people well know, prior to the pandemic, I was one of the few physicians in the country um, with my focus in parasitology using ivermectin for um, strongyloides, for scabies. And we even had a case of a gentleman at Yale who got way too much steroids and ended up with a strongyloides hyperinfection. So yeah, ivermectin has a certain role in certain patients. We have yet to have the level of data that I would consider compelling that the FDA would consider compelling that whatever side effects are outweighed by any benefit. And convalescent plasma, I'm throwing this right in here at the same time. Um, you know, we still have people that are very excited about convalescent plasma. And I just really want to say here, the data is in, right? So, um, you know, I don't, don't want to prove me wrong. I've said with ivermectin, we didn't do the trials. We're still waiting for a clear guidance. Convalescent plasma, we spent billions of dollars. The data is in. Um, and the ID Society of America the IDSA really has made it clear um, in their recommendations based upon this science. So recommendation number eight from the IDSA for COVID treatment among patients hospitalized with COVID-19, the IDSA guideline panel suggests against COVID-19 convalescent plasma. Um, in the outpatient setting, okay, they still say it's reasonable to consider clinical trials, but not using it outside. Um, and it doesn't matter to me, this, you know, if you get your, you know, your local bee produced artisanal plasma, the, the data does not support. I mean, I understand the passion, people were excited, um, the data's in. Um, this does not really have a role um, in the treatment of COVID-19. All right, um, so make sure I get those. Um, what do they mail those, Daniel at microbe.tv? That's okay. right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, um, children, COVID, mental health. Now, children are at risk if they get COVID. I think that is now really clear. And I keep saying wearing a mask is less traumatic for a child than being hospitalized. Um, I'm going to throw in here not only children, but pregnant women, um, women who are about to have children. Um, you know, and I've, I've been asked um, actually to give an update on pregnancy and COVID-19. And we certainly have much more data now than I was first asked this question live on CNN back in March 2020. When they prepped me, I would be talking about the president and testing. And then, boom, <laughs> Dr. Griffin, tell us about pregnant women and COVID. And <laughs> so that seems a little bit different than what we were going to discuss. But anyway, the article 
characteristics. Oh, I was wearing the same bow tie. So just to bring everyone back to that day, I'll mess with it. Um, <clears throat> the article, Characteristics and Outcomes of Women with COVID-19 Giving Birth at U.S. Academic Centers During the COVID-19 Pandemic, um, was published um, in as a peer-reviewed article in JAMA Network Open. Um, and I think it really gives us a solid overview of how devastating COVID-19 can be for pregnant women. Um, for some time, we've been encouraging vaccination before, during, after pregnancy. Um, and here's a little bit of data. Not only do we know it's safe, um, but what is driving this? What, what can happen if um, a pregnant uh, person gets infected with COVID? So this was a retrospective cohort study. They looked at 869,079 adult women um, within this cohort, um, 18,715 um, of the women had COVID-19. Um, and they found, what did they find? The women with COVID-19, the pregnant women with COVID-19 were more likely, if they got infected with COVID-19, right, to have a preterm birth, right? So the negative impact on the baby, significantly higher rates of ICU admission, um, significant odds of ending up um, getting intubated, mechanical ventilation, that was up by about 14 fold, and they were 15 times as likely to die if they ended up in the hospital, right? So these are vaccine preventable tragedies for the mothers and the babies. And as per the CDC numbers, we are seeing over a thousand new, new infections per week in pregnant people, right? So this is, these are vaccine preventable tragedies. So pregnant women, they should get vaccinated. Don't, don't wait for any particular trimester. The earlier in the pregnancy, um, the better chance that they're going to have the ability to not only protect themselves, the unborn child, but also when that child is born, um, the ability to pass those antibodies. Um, I also want everyone, I'm going to suggest people bookmark on their computer. I have a few things that I bookmark, you know, where I keep track of what's going on. And one of the things that I bookmark is the um, AAP, children and COVID-19 state level data. Um, and this is where they keep track of what's happening in children. And we are now seeing thousands of children each week. Thousands of children each week are being hospitalized for COVID-19. Um, and if you look at that greater than 100,000 people in the US that are currently in the hospital, depending on which state you look at, that's sort of two to 4% of those hospitalized individuals are children. Um, so, you know, if not for yourself, get vaccinated and engage in behaviors to protect our children. Um, and remember, wearing a mask is less traumatic for a child than being hospitalized. So um, there was, I'm going to throw this in in this section, and it was where they were looking about um, long COVID in children. Um, and I was a little shocked, I guess, um, confused by the BBC News interpretation of this. So let me go through the, the preprint that the BBC News was talking about. And this was the preprint long COVID, the physical and mental health of children and non-hospitalized young people three months after SARS-CoV-2 infection, a national matched cohort study, the clock study. Um, so this is a preprint under review. Um, this was a cohort study of test positive um, compared to age, sex, and ge geographically matched test negative children. Um, and what they did here is um, these children completed detailed detailed questionnaires um, three months post this positive test or post not having a positive test. Um, and this is a challenging paper, I'll be honest. You can imagine if you have an adolescent child um, and you start asking them how they feel, there's a lot of background here. Um, so it's really a challenge um, sorting out what might be going on relative to background. There's also the challenge here that there's no universally agreed upon definition of long COVID. Um, and I, I like to say long COVID is really a subset of post-acute sequelae of COVID. Of COVID. It's sort of a, um, a chronic syndrome um, where PASC includes things like new diagnosis of diabetes, um, new diagnosis of stroke, other things in there. Um, and it really was um, one of the tables that I wanted to go through. Um, so if you go through this study, and I'm going to encourage people to go ahead and um, uh, spend some time. Hopefully we'll post this. Um, but they have a really nice table, table three. Um, and here you can look at the different issues. And I did not find this reassuring. So they asked a number of questions. So one of the big things we see in um, long COVID in all ages is this just incredible amount of fatigue. In the negative, that was 3.3. 
three months out, it was still 22.7% of the children reporting that. Shortness of breath, 1.5 up to 11.6. Um, 20% of them still couldn't smell, and that was rare. That was only about 1.5% in the negative group. Um, headaches, right? 4.8% background. This was 26.3% at three months after um, acute COVID in these children. Um, unusually strong muscle pains, right? A lot of people have these muscle pains. That was about 1% background. It was 11% um, in these children at three months. So I, I was not reassured <laughs> when the BBC said, oh, it, it's much lower than that 80% we were fearing. Um, I was quite um, concerned when I'm seeing uh, such high prevalence three months out of symptoms in these children. So um, just to repeat, COVID is a problem um, in children. They may not die of COVID. Um, they may be at lower risk of ending up in the hospital than adults, maybe in the one or 2% of them. Um, but boy, this is a large chunk of kids three months out still suffering. Transmission, testing, never miss an opportunity to test. Um, here, there's a bunch of things I feel like I'm saying over and over again. Um, there was a preprint here. Actually, it wasn't a preprint. It was published in the MMWR. Um, you know, as much as people criticize the CDC, you'll find out I discuss a lot of MMWR papers. So um, kudos to the people at the CDC who keep getting this information out there. And this I thought was very interesting. It was sort of one of several publications along this line um, that I saw this last week. And this was Outbreak Associated with SARS-CoV-2 B1617.2, the Delta variant, in an elementary school, Marin County, California. Um, and one of the things I really liked about this was they showed a seeding map, right? Um, and this is where we have an, an unvaccinated, symptomatic, infected teacher who does what I see all the time, right? When someone wants to talk, when they want to generate all those droplets and aerosols, they pull off the mask, right? She wants to read to the children. Um, and so she was unmasked reading aloud to the class. The majority of the kids got infected. Um, everyone in the front row, most of the kids in the second row, um, you, know, you really wanted to be in the back. Um, so um, really, really tough um, when we talk about, you know, masking and vaccination in these settings. All right, well, what about testing, right? Um, think of, I, I feel like I go through this talk every time and I do it every week. Every week on Wednesdays, I do like a COVID clinical update for all our urgent care centers in the tri-state area. And, and about 250, 300 providers tune in to these. Um, and, you know, it's still shocking to me that this far into the pandemic, there's still so much misinformation about testing. Um, now, I will say that Pro Health New York, Riverside, Caramount, Pro Health Connecticut, all these parts of Optum Tri-State have really invested heavily in creating access to COVID-19 tests. And each week, um, a chunk of my week is spent um, addressing questions. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is understanding what's the best test um, and whether or not there are certain situations when you may do more than one test. So the research letter, validation of an at-home, remember at-home direct antigen rapid test for COVID-19 was published in JAMA Network Open. Um, and I know it's been quite a while since we first sort of looked at this idea um, of people having the ability to test themselves at home with um, rapid tests. So this study, I think, really builds on things that we keep talking about. Um, this idea that we talked about last week that the peak of contagiousness um, and perhaps the majority of all transmission from infected individual occurs in the two days prior and the three days following the onset of symptoms, right? So during that period of time when there's a very high level of viral RNA load, when there's a very high level of antigen, so here the investigators followed 257 individuals self-collecting nasal swab specimens twice weekly at home during a six-month period. Um, the investigators um, were studying a real-world implementation of this high-frequency testing using an inexpensive, at-home, um, self-administered direct antigen rapid test, so the, the DART D-A-R-T, direct antigen rapid test. And they were then using um, RT-PCR as um, a comparison. Um, now, remember, these are individuals. These are not medical experts. These are just people taking swabs and sticking them up their noses. Um, the individual self-collected these during this six-month period. The DART sensitivity for that zero to three days 
was 96.3%, right? I know a lot of people keep talking about antigens being low sensitivity tests. If you're looking for someone who is infectious, who is capable of transmission, 96.3% is not low sensitivity in my book. Um, even if you really stretch this out to zero to 12 um, days after symptom onset, when we're really starting to get past the point, they still were 78.9% um, sensitive. So I sort of want to even challenge this concept that antigen tests have an issue with um, sensitivity. They actually have great sensitivity if the question is, is this person acutely infected and potentially contagious? Um, so this does feed into that, you know, that experience that um, don't think the portal of anecdotes is data because you will, when a person comes in, if you do this test, you're going to pick up most people who are contagious right away within 15 minutes. You're going to be able to pull them out of circulation before transmission. Um, but there will be a certain number of people who you're catching either prior to becoming um, contagious or you're catching after that. Um, and I will certainly say when we're in the hospital, we're looking for a higher sensitivity test because we're really asking the question, did you get infected You know, a week or two ago? Because we're usually um, seeing them when they're showing up during that early inflammatory phase. So one of the things that I say is don't miss an opportunity to test, but I guess I'm going to say don't miss an opportunity to rapidly get an answer and intervene. If you want to throw a PCR in as a second test, you know, that's going to make sense in certain situations. And also a test does not predict the future, right? So you get exposed on Saturday, you have a negative test on Sunday. I would expect that you're not going to really start turning positive until about four days later. Okay. Another preprint just posted today, hot off the preprint press. Um, and this um, really helps continue along this lines of connecting dots about what happens when a vaccinated person gets infected with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this was longitudinal analysis of SARS-CoV-2 vaccine <coughs> breakthrough infections reveal limited infectious viral shedding and restrict tissue distribution. Um, now, the authors reported on viral dynamics and infectious virus shedding through daily longitudinal sampling in a small cohort of adults infected with SARS-CoV-2 at various stages of vaccination, right? So not vaccinated, one dose, two doses. Um, this paper is still binary in terms of um, being able to culture virus or not, right? So it doesn't have that quantification that we would like. Um, but they did report that vaccinated individuals were less likely um, to test viral culture positive and that the decay of the viral RNA load um, was more rapid in vaccinated individuals. Um, and they also have nice data, again, on antigen test correlating with the ability to culture virus, um, really continuing to support that narrative that antigen tests are a great way to jump in and pick up those people during that infectious period when they're capable of transmitting um, virus. And that was in figure 1G of this, which I think is worth reading. All right. Active vaccination. Never miss an opportunity to vaccinate. And yes, vaccination is how this pandemic ends. Um, this is actually, I'm going to say this is a pearl. Um, you know, I, I get this question every so often, and perhaps our listeners do not realize we have a lot of clinicians that listen, um, but also maybe we have some people still waiting to get vaccinated or maybe people getting ready to get that third dose. Um, COVID vaccinations don't necessarily have to go in the deltoid. <clears throat> you can actually as per the CDC, the anterior lateral thigh can be used. They actually have a nice table. A 1.5 inch needle may be used if administering the vaccine in this site, in the anterior lateral thigh. Um, sort of encourage people not to stick needles in the um, behind. You've got nerves, blood vessels, the lateral thigh. That's the modern place if you don't want to go into the deltoid. Um, all right. Um, and why did my pediatrician always give it in my butt? That that was that was old school, I have to say. <laughs> and actually, you know, it's funny. I was in the Dominican Republic when this came up, and in certain parts of the world, people have a lower body mass than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So you actually see about one percent of the time in some of these populations, you're causing complications. So hmm. maybe you had, you know, I don't know, adequate um, butt tissue there, Vincent. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, we've tried to. If you look at the science on this, it's probably better off to move away from the the tail. Okay. 
Um, well, we've entered a period that I'm going to call the battle of the vaccines. I see T-shirts on the horizon, you know, the spike vax and the comerity T-shirts. Um, but people all want to know, you know, what, what is the best vaccine, you know, and what team are you on? Um, and the first, uh, this peer-reviewed publication that I will talk about, comparison of SARS-CoV-2 antibody response following vaccination with BNT162B2 and mRNA1273. So that's the Pfizer or the Comerti, Com Comerti and the Spike Vax or the Moderna. Um, and, you know, everyone keeps telling us, don't look at the antibody titers, but what did they do? They looked at the antibody titers and they're twice as high after the Moderna shot. So of course we all want to get the Moderna shot now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we also had another preprint. Um, I got spike vax, the Moderna, by the way, just saying. Um, comparison of two highly effective mRNA vaccines for COVID-19 during periods of alpha and delta variant prevalence. Um, and here they're actually reporting on what they say is effectiveness. Now, what does that mean um, of the mRNA vaccines? So what they say here, they look at um, data from the Mayo Clinic Health System, um, this period January to July of 2021. Um, we had different variants, um, you know, alpha and then delta variant. Um, so first, the reassuring data, right? Both vaccines continue to be highly effective during this period against SARS-CoV-2 associated hospitalizations. We're looking at 91.6%, we're looking at 85%. Even when you go into July, right, still 81%, still 75%. But then they throw in the new superpower comparison, vaccine effectiveness against infection. And here they say 76% for the Moderna spike vax and only 42% for the Comirnaty Pfizer folks. Um, and then they go ahead and, of course, just to, you know, make it worse, this is a twofold risk reduction against, quote unquote, breakthrough infection. Um, they speculate on mRNA content. Um, and Vincent, do you have any comments about this? Oh, why do we care about infection? Don't we care just about disease, in, in particular serious disease? You know, that's an interesting question. And I'm going to, the one thing I will say, right, and I, and I think in general, this is a new thing we're asking vaccines to do, we're asking about. And we're going to get to a study where we look at what if you're vaccinated and you get an infection, you don't end up in the hospital. What about your risk of long COVID? Do people who are vaccinated get long COVID? So that I'm going to hold on to that thought because I'm going to okay. talk a little bit about because that that is going to potentially raise an issue because that is disease, right? Long COVID is disease. And are the vaccines protecting against that? Um, all right, so passive vaccination, right? Um, we have a developing story here, right? So passive vaccination is ideally getting something, a monoclonal and antibody as prophylaxis. So we, we got the, um, the Provent phase three prophylaxis trial results. They met their primary endpoint, the data was announced. So this was a trial that included 5,197 participants in a two to one randomization to receive this AZD7442, two monoclonal cocktail or placebo. Uh, this is still at the press release stage. Uh, they do report that you know most of these individuals had comorbidities, right? So putting them at higher risk. Um, and then they report that this combination reduced the risk of developing symptomatic COVID-19 by 77% compared to placebo. No cases of severe COVID-19 um, or COVID-19 related deaths in those treated. Um, in the placebo arm, there were three cases of severe COVID-19, there were two deaths. Um, so I keep keep pushing on, and this I've actually seen a, a number of emails, number of alerts from the Catholic health system, which I really applaud. Um, so um, if my buddies over there are listening, um, it's been order, added as an order set. We send folks over. You're a high risk individual. You've had an exposure. Um, we get these individuals monoclonals prophylactically. Um, Regeneron actually has um, EUA expansion for this, um, but unfortunately, right. Only about a third of eligible patients are getting this highly effective therapy. If someone is um, vaccinated, it doesn't matter. If someone is pregnant, actually, as I think we've discussed, that puts them in a high risk category and they would be eligible for this as well. Okay. Um, now the period of viral replication, what I like to say, the time for monitoring in monoclonals, not the time for antibiotics. Um, 
And I've talked previously, and I hit on this early on, the ACTIVE-6 trial, which is a COVID-19 study of repurposed drugs. And uh, David Fagenbaum was on TWIV 766 talking a little bit about this whole concept of trying to find stuff on the shelf that might um, be potentially helpful. Um, this trial is going to investigate ivermectin, inhaled fluticasone, and fluvoxamine. So what, what is fluvoxamine, right? We've all heard about ivermectin lot about ivermectin. We've all heard about steroids like dexamethasone. Here is an inhaled formulation. But what is fluvoxamine? Now, fluvoxamine is a, I'm going to say a Prozac-like drug. It's an SSRI, a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, and we recently had a preprint. Um, this is the effect of early treatment with fluvoxamine on risk of emergency care and hospitalization among patients with COVID-19 the Together Randomized Platform Clinical Trial. Um, so we've been waiting for this for a while. This was a placebo or controlled randomized adaptive platform trial conducted among symptomatic Brazilian adults confirmed positive for SARS-CoV-2. Um, these were patients with a known risk factor for progression to severe disease. Uh, the patients were randomly assigned to either fluvoxamine, 100 milligrams twice daily for 10 days, or placebo, and the primary endpoint was a composite outcome of an emergency room um, visit for greater than six hours of observation or ending up in the hospital um, in the 28 days post-randomization. This was an intent to treat analysis. Um, now, a total of 3,238 patients were allocated. Um, we ended up with um, 739 getting fluvoxamine. We ended up with 733 in the placebo group. There actually were other treatments, and there was an N of 1766 for those. Um, what did they find? Uh, the proportion of patients with this composite endpoint of observation in the ER for greater than six hours or admission to the hospital was lower relative risk, 0.71. So about a 29% reduction. Most of these outcomes, 88% of them, were hospitalizations. Um, they also looked at viral clearance. They didn't see a difference there. Um, they looked at other outcomes, mortality, time to death, um, number of days ventilated, et cetera. They didn't find anything there. So it really was just this really mainly an outcome on the impact of hospitalizations. This is an interesting study, but this is what Active 6 and other trials are going to address. I really don't want people to rush out. This is not two years ago where everyone starts rushing out and putting someone on a drug just because there's one, one study. Um, this is helpful. This supports including this in Active 6. Um, so if you find this exciting, uh, Google, go to clinicaltrials.org, get your patients connected for Active 6. Yeah, Daniel, so of all the things they looked at, Mortality, time to death, days hospitalized, days ventilated. No change except the time you spend in the emergency room. What does that mean? <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's look at remdesivir, right? So remdesivir, $3,000 a course. Um, and all we have is maybe less people spend less time in the hospital, right? Um, you know, here is a medication. We're not seeing a mortality benefit. There's no crime against humanity here. We don't have to rush to get this to market. Maybe less people end up in the hospital. It is a psychiatric uh, drug, so maybe they feel a little bit better. I don't feel like they need to go to the hospital. Made me think of digoxin, um, which apparently if you give people digoxin, they're less likely to go to the hospital. But um, yeah. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to jump to tail the tail phase, long COVID, post-COVID, um, we had the article, one-year outcomes in hospital survivors with COVID-19, a longitudinal cohort study. This was published in The Lancet. Uh, this was an ambidirectional study, meaning it's both retrospective and prospective phases of the study. Um, COVID-19 survivors who were discharged from um, this particular hospital in Wuhan, China, um, between January 7th and May 29th of 2020. Um, and we have um, six-month and 12-month follow-up visit um, questionnaires looking at symptoms, health-related quality of life questions. Uh, these individuals also had a physical examination, a six-minute walking test, and laboratory tests as well. Um, what they reported that the proportion of patients with at least one sequelae symptom was 68% at six months and 49% at 12 months. Fatigue, muscle weakness were the most common symptoms. Um, you know, 
maybe this is why they said in kids that it's better than this. Um, so by comparison, maybe that's what they were after. Um, but I have to say, um, long COVID is continuing to be a tragedy. We do a lot of, um, I'll say, consulting with companies who are trying to figure out um, employees that developed acute COVID who now cannot end up um, back at their pre-COVID um, employment. It's about 10 or 12% at these large companies that are use um, UHC as their insurance. Um, this, this is tough, right? Um, you know, even if you could cut that in half, you'd still be five or 6% severely affected enough that they can't return to work. Um, one of the things they did comment, and I think this is consistent with what we've seen before, what's predictive of people who end up with long COVID, which I suggest is a subset of PASC, um, higher risk for women, um, higher risk for people who receive steroids or had more severe disease. The, those two may be a little bit intertwined, right? If you have more severe disease, you may meet criteria for steroids. Um, now we have, I'm going to say this is positive news, but then you can tell me if it's positive news because this gets back to this issue of, do we need to infect, do we need to prevent more than hospitalizations and deaths? Do we care about infection? And so this was the paper, risk factors and disease profile of post-vaccination SARS-CoV-2 infection in UK users of the COVID-19 symptom study app, a prospective community-based nested case control study. Um, so actually just COVID, not COVID-19. I think we're starting to drop COVID-19. It's sort of the only COVID out there. Um, this was a <laughs> prospective community-based nested case control study, right? So they've got a big cohort and they're looking within that. Um, this was self-reported data um, from this UK-based um, database cohort. Um, everyone was an adult, so greater than or equal to 18 years of age. Um, this is a mobile phone app that they're using, so really kind of clever here. Um, and then they're going to look at cases that received a first or a second dose. Um, they're going to look at people that um, tested positive. So what, what were sort of the, the takeaway from this? So in addition to all the other benefits of benefits of vaccination, which just were sort of reinforced in this study, they found that the odds of having symptoms for 28 days or more, so long COVID, after post-vaccination infection was approximately halved by having two vaccine doses. Um, so this result suggests that the risk of long COVID is reduced at individuals who have received double vaccination. Um, this is sort of a little bit of an issue and I think gets back to that um, original. I was saying that from our large cohorts, maybe 10 or 12% of individuals have such severe long COVID, they can't return to work. Um, it's gonna be really interesting to tease out how severe is this long COVID because half of 10 or 12%, half of those large numbers, if we still have five or 6% of people who get COVID with long COVID, um, preventing them from going to work, if you take some of those other numbers that we talked about, 68% having a symptom at six months, you drop that to 34. These are still big numbers. So this does raise the question um, of considering long COVID as disease. So maybe that gets at my, like, do we want to protect, want to protect them against infection completely? Um, I think that what we're really, what I'm really trying to say here is I think long COVID falls under the disease and one of the things we want to prevent. The problem, uh, Daniel, is that this is different from every other vaccine because there's no long measles, there's no long polio, right? And so if if this is true, and I think we need to know more about what variants were circulating and so forth, uh, that could be an issue. I agree. Yeah, no, excellent point. Excellent point. All right. Um, so I always like to touch on the world situation, right? Um, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Um, and I think on an upcoming episode, I'm going to probably spend a little time talking about the global vaccine initiative, discussing Gavi and COVAX. Um, also potentially give our listeners a little bit of insight into how they might contribute and be part of that effort. Um, but along those lines, um, Reminders to all our listeners throughout the months of August, September, October, donations made to PWB are going to support floating doctors. And let me uh, share an email I just recently got from Jolie Lebrot of Floating Doctors, uh, just letting folks know what's going on down there. The team in Panama is faring well and is accepting volunteers to begin seeing more patients for primary care. Thankfully, cases in Panama, including Bocas, are on the decline, though as in the U.S., misinformation spreads as quickly as the virus itself. Right now, Bocas is getting doses in waves. These are the vaccine doses. 
through the 5th, they will be offering the vaccine in Bocastown and on three neighboring islands. The more remote communities have yet to receive the vaccine, though some of the communities on the mainland closer to cities have been able to access them. Floating Doctors is currently working hard to educate people about the vaccine and are coordinating with the local ministries of health to assist in distribution when they become available. So go to parasites.border, parasiteswithoutborders.com, donate so we can help support this effort. Yeah, let me go back very briefly to the long COVID. Is it possible yeah. that, since we don't really know how long long COVID is, maybe people who are vaccinated, even though 50% may still get it, maybe it's shorter than non-vaccinated long COVID? Yeah, there's a couple things that this study, well, there's, there's several things that this study um, doesn't tell us. And I think it's great that we're bouncing back to this. Um, you know, this is a, you know, people using a phone app, right? So there's going to be a little bit of selection bias. If you're done with COVID and moving on with your life, this may, there may be a reporting bias. You're more likely to jump on so that the number may be, um, may yeah. be different. Um, the severity may be different. Um, and also this is, this is really a short follow-up, right? This is 28 days. You're yeah. barely there in my mind. I always say that 28 days is sort of the early, um, people who are vaccinated. What, what if we go to two months, three months? Um, I'm still optimistic. I mean, the, the biology, the science suggests to me that we should see protection against this type of disease as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I agree. All right. Time for some questions. For Daniel, you can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Uh, Jeff from California, my wife and I are both scientists and we are having a serious scientific disagreement by studying the literature. She has decided that one can be infectious without the tests detecting the infection. She's not talking about normal false negative rate, but rather there is a couple of day period before the symptom onset where some patients can be infectious, but not shedding enough virus to be detected by the standard tests <laughs> below the detection threshold. Sorry, below the detection threshold of the test. I think that regardless of her reading around, this is impossible. I suppose this might be slightly possible if somehow the virus is in your lungs, but not your nose, but where the test is done. But this seems unlikely to me and would happen in a vanishingly small number of cases. So can you help distinguish between her reading around and my logic? Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to get in trouble here, right? You know, your, your wife is always right, but some of the things she's thinking perhaps need to evolve a little bit. Um, our tests are incredibly sensitive. And I think I've talked several times about this large testing program we have for the movie industry. Um, the tests actually, particularly the PCR, turns positive prior to a person becoming infectious. So yes, the period when a person is mostly contagious, mostly transmitting is two days before symptom onset three days afterwards, but there's a little bit of a tail there to the right. Uh, your PCR turns positive prior to you spraying. If this wasn't true, our whole screening program um, would have been a disaster. You know, all the content you're enjoying on, you know, Amazon Prime and Netflix wouldn't be there, Lionsgate, et cetera. So no, the tests pick a person up before they become um, infectious. And actually with the PCR, it continues to pick you up even after you've period pass through that period of time. Um, the antigen tests tend to correlate more with that period of um, contagiousness, um, high levels of the viral um, antigen. Um, the, but I will say the one thing that maybe your wife is right about, and maybe she was thinking is none of our tests are hundred um, percent sensitive. So you're going to, you're going to miss stuff, um, but you're just missing stuff because of failure of the test, not because of a biology. Zinta from New York writes, our daughter was born during the pandemic and due to lockdown had limited contact to other children and adults. As a result, she's never been sick with colds or other illnesses. She's now 15 months. We would like to enroll her in daycare for socialization and learning. However, the increasing rates of COVID and hospitalization in young children is alarming. As you highlight in 797, I worry that by sending my one-year-old to daycare, I may be dooming her to COVID-19 with unknown consequences. To minimize risks, would you keep infants and toddlers out of daycare as long as possible and try to wait for a vaccine? Or can risks of infection be minimized by going to daycare two or three days a week or by dropping out if prevalence increases above a certain threshold in the community? Or is hospitalization still so rare in toddlers and infants that we really should not worry about COVID and focus on the benefits of socialization at this young age? 
Okay. So there's a lot, lot in there to unpack, but I'm going to focus on, I think, the main overriding thing is that we've been talking about for a while. We have uh, presented several studies on this, is that you can safely get children in schools. You can safely actually get children under the age of six in these child care settings. Um, there are certain recommended mitigation strategies to make that safe. I think there was actually a recent study where like children in school like had one third the rate of infection as opposed to the community, right? So if you look at some of these mitigation strategies, um, vaccinating the staff, um, that's huge, right? That's going to reduce their chance of getting infected. And I think we have a growing body of evidence, their chance of spreading it to others. Regular testing programs, um, good ventilation. Um, kids at this age, they're not wearing masks. I think that's just reasonable. Um, but there are ways to do this safely. And I'm going to say there's ways to do it safely that that outweigh, that sort of would err on the side of your your potentially better off having your child in this setting with all the advantages of the social interaction. This can be done safely. Jamie writes, I'm an emergency physician and mom of two ages one and two years old working in Albuquerque, New Mexico. You mentioned in the last update that the overall risk of hospitalization is 2% for children. I was wondering if we have more information about that specifically. What's the breakdown by age group? I would imagine under one year old is most likely to require hospitalization, but beyond that, what's the median length of stay for these children? What interventions are, are being needed? And what is the rate of children requiring in intubation? What comorbidities or other factors contribute to risk of hospitalization? And lastly, what is the rate of MISC or do we even know? Okay, so this is fantastic, right? This is the kind of this is the kind of questions and knowledge that you want your physician to uh, seek. Um, and I, I talked early on in the children COVID section that um, the AAP children and COVID-19 state level data page, not only does it have like uh, an overview, but you can go to the very bottom and you can actually download this extensive PDF with answers to a lot of the questions that you're asking um, about. So yeah, as you can imagine, I, I've looked through this and there really is a gradation, right? The closer you get to being an adult, the closer your risks are to those of an adult. The younger you get, the lower those get. Um, and then I talked a little bit about, depending on where you look in you know, different states, it might be as low as 1.6 of the hospitalizations are children. Other states, it's 3.6. But they break this down into all these different variables, age, state, et cetera. Thomas writes, my mother suffers from a few autoimmune diseases, lupus, Sjogren syndrome, antiphospholipid syndrome. She hasn't been vaccinated yet out of fear of thrombosis. Her doctor could say only that she, on the one hand, recommends getting vaccinated, but on the other hand, does not recommend it. One problem is that depending to which doctor she goes regarding her disease in general, some recommend getting anticoagulants, others tell her she can live without them. Uh, so she doesn't take anything against thrombosis as exercise might be enough and is the more comfortable option. Since I doubt that herd immunity is around the corner anytime soon, my question is, do I want to get infected with or without vaccine protection? What's the best way to go from here for my mother? Okay. So there's a lot in there. And there was that one question, you know, about a person with lupus, do they benefit being on anticoagulation or not? Um, and there are certain features I'm going to defer to the rheumatologist um, who can sort of sort that out and make that. But what about COVID, right? We're saying at this point, your choice is between getting exposed to COVID, having a natural infection with all the risks and benefits or the vaccine. Um, I am going to recommend, you know, in a situation like this, I would recommend vaccination because the risks of clotting complications with COVID are significant. Um, so an individual like this who gets COVID, I would be quite concerned, 20-30% um, chance of a venous or arterial clotting complication. Um, we probably would recommend an mRNA um, vaccine in an individual like this. And the other, I want to use this opportunity. There was a recent study, and I was going to put it in, but this is even better just to bring it up. There are a bunch of people say, I've had lots and lots of allergies. I've had issues with other vaccines. I, I want a letter from my allergist or doctor saying I don't have to get this vaccine. They looked at these individuals and individuals, even with a report of multiple allergies, all kinds of other issues, 99% of these individuals tolerate these vaccines. The few, per, the few like the 1% or so, tend to have mild issues. So if you've had an issue with this vaccine or a component in this vaccine, that's one thing. But if you have autoimmune diseases, if you have allergies, if you have the other things, we are still routinely recommending vaccination across the board, much safer than getting COVID. 
All right. And because this is episode 800, one extra email. This is <laughs> a statement that I think we need to make. It's not really a question from Lena, uh, who uh, says, I know I'm probably t preaching to the choir since most of your listeners are like-minded, but I wanted to send this in. She posted it on her Facebook page in hopes it would give anti-vaxxers an idea of what life is like for those who are scared. So her child is uh, seven years old. He has made it to age seven, only through the help of many doctors, medicines, and the alert and aware adults in his life. He's medically fragile. He doesn't look it, but he is one of millions with an invisible illness. He's been in the hospital multiple times, takes multiple medications every day. He's at high risk. He's why we're continuing to stay home, mask up, get vaccinated, and only allow vaccinated individuals to visit. If you think a vaccine is traumatic, imagine watching your child struggle to breathe gray-skinned and blue-lipped. If you think wearing a mask is too much, imagine wearing, watching doctors and nurses pump your child full of medicines to help him breathe. If you think staying home is hard, imagine a doctor telling you that they're gonna try one more thing, but if it doesn't work, they're gonna have to in intubate your child to give him a break from working so hard to breathe. If you think a cold is no big deal, imagine lying behind your child in a hospital bed, watching the number on the oxygen monitor, praying it stays above 90 so it doesn't beep and summon the nurse again so you can get five minutes of sleep. Imagine that, then imagine it again and again. That's only a fraction of what we've endured as a family. Those things are traumatic. They're too much. They're hard. They're a big deal. Those things are why we keep him safe He's not disposable. He's not a burden. He's very much loved by everyone. He brings joy to our lives. He deserves to be protected. Protect him and the millions of people who suffer from invisible illnesses. Happy birthday, JJ. Thank you for teaching us so much. Wow. It's a very, very powerful um, email. Um, and yeah, I, I, you know, I wish that all the people, you know, but I, I, was, I was talking to my wife today, right? The polls have gotten to the point where it's down to only about 20% of people are saying they, they would refuse to get vaccinated. And we think half of those people may have already been vaccinated. They just don't want to <laughs> lose membership in the tribe. So this, this, this vaccine hesitant or anti-vax population, it's, it's really shrinking. Um, they're very loud. They're very vocal. Um, but I think a lot of people realize that a lot of people are coming. This isn't just about you. You. We live in a community, right? This is like having a protest, you know, advocating for drunk driving or something. You know, if you get COVID and you transmit it, you could kill someone else, um, and you could end up. We're seeing thousands of kids end up in the hospital each week. The majority of those children were infected by someone who's unvaccinated. So that's on the unvaccinated. Don't just think about yourself. I think our listeners are um, on board with this. I also think it's a good response to people say, oh, it's traumatic for kids to wear face masks in school. As you have said, Daniel, far more traumatic to be in the hospital. Yeah, yeah. That's COVID-19 clinical update number 78 with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone, including you, Vincent, be safe. <laughs>